conductive wire And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and today I am joined by Tim Matthews, Katie Schaefer, and Jonathan Lally. We're diving back into The Mandalorian with a discussion on Season 2. How are you all doing today? Doing good, doing good. Fantastic. I'm doing great. Awesome. Well, the first question I want to hit you all with is, what was your excitement level going into this season after having watched season one? And then the three of us also discussed that one on the podcast. I don't know, I don't know if there's any other other option other than I was super hyped. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I could not wait for this season to start. Yeah. It, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure we'll get into what was exciting about it, but right. uh, I was super hyped. Um, the first season I watched twice before we did the last podcast, and then I'm pretty sure I watched the first season again, I don't know, sometime throughout the year. And, uh, um, you know, even some stuff in the first season that maybe I was kind of like not as super high on. Uh, at first, I had come around on the second time and just couldn't wait to see, oh, where are they going to take this? I hope this person comes back. Maybe maybe they'll bring in these characters. And then, of course, we had a lot of rumors and uh, and ideas on some of the stuff was coming. So it just made it that much more rad. Yeah. Katie, how about you? I was really excited for it. I mean, all of the pre-production stuff that I saw looked good. I really, really enjoyed the first season. I rewatched it, all of it, like... okay the night before the season two started. <laughs> so I had my like, I di didn't do it all in one chunk, but I finished my rewatch right before it so mm -hmm. that I had it all fresh in my mind. And, and I, I believe on the last one I taught, we, I talked about um, wanting seven baby Yoda figures. <laughs> well, I've only acquired one so far, but I'm going to get there someday. <laughs> That's how much I liked the second season. <laughs> yeah. I have, the child Funko. So, you know, of course I had to get one of those, but Jonathan, how excited were you for this season? Oh, I was, I was really excited. Uh, you know, I, I think all of us can probably agree that it's been a crappy year and it was a much needed escape last year. So yeah, my hype was on maximum levels going into season two, especially since I believe that they had shot most of it pretty much before the pandemic started. Like, I think it was pretty much in the can by the time, you know, lockdown started and everything started being awful. So I was very excited and just, you know, was in big need of an escape. So I was very excited. I'm always excited for Star Wars stuff. And even the stuff that, you know, I think the majority of us, if not all of us, haven't enjoyed as much. It's still Star Wars, but this takes it to a whole different level because when we watched season one, it really felt like something brand new because we're seeing new characters. This story is coming to us on the small screen instead of the big screen. And then this season, they do a lot more with Star Wars lore as a whole, I think, than they did in season one. And that is something that I was definitely excited for because you knew it was going to come into play at some point. But I do want to start off the actual discussion of the season with some of our feelings on the overall story arc. We're going to dive into specific characters and their arcs shortly here, but I think with these eight episodes, they do a very nice job of giving you a story that's sort of contained season by season, because I felt like you could watch season two without having watched season one necessarily, and it still would have made sense for the most part. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I I feel like even if you know things that things that you might lose is you know the same as any anything else. If you're jumping in a little late, you might lose some of just not having the emotional connection to certain characters or certain characters' relationships. But they did a really nice job of just continuing the story, but also being just this season's story and any. Any information that you might need, they did a good job of just kind of refreshing your your memory, even if it was within the episode or, you know, right beforehand with the previously on. I know a number of people who jumped onto Mandalorian this season 
after hearing how good like season one was. Yeah, I think they I agree. I think you could watch this without having watched it, if, especially if you have some awareness of Star Wars and have seen it. If you don't, they'd probably be real confused. But I think that that previously on, they really edited that well so that if you'd missed it or you'd only watch the first season once or whatever, it gave you the background you needed in order to move forward and enjoy the episode. And I usually watch them regardless of, like I said, I finished it the night before I started and I was still like, oh yeah, that part of it. <laughs> yeah. So I really liked it and I was, I was pleased with how well they did that. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think um, obviously there's some characters you would miss out and probably be scratching your head on, but for the most part, I feel like it's something that anyone could just dip into and enjoy. Um, especially if you're a Star Wars person. I mean, I think this season especially really did a good job of getting back to the basics of Star Wars and was a nice palate cleanser uh, for those of us who weren't a huge fan of the last movie or even the last few movies. This was just really nice. And uh, yeah, I do agree. I do agree that like, you know, someone who is a casual viewer could dip into an episode, see something they like, and then feel maybe that it was necessary to go back and watch the other episodes, but it is something that anyone could enjoy not having seen what came previously. Right. And they're hitting us with more Star Wars lore than before within the first handful of episodes, it feels like almost. Obviously, with the first episode, which is Chapter 9, The Marshal, we get our fun Timothy Oliphant performance as Cobb Vanth. And yes, he is having quite a year because he's someone who kind of plays these character roles and you don't really seem to see him too often, but he's also in Fargo season four from this year. And by the time everyone is listening to this, it is now 2021. So I suppose from 2020 Fargo season four, but he's always a fun person to just see on the screen. And I think that sort of comedy level mixed in with the lore and having the Tuscan Raiders come in to play and you have all of these other things that happen throughout the season where you're like, oh, okay, you know, we're, we're definitely getting into the weeds with some of this lore here. And then you have the reveal at the end of the Marshall with Boba Fett. And you're just like, okay, I see what you're doing here. You know, you're giving us a little something, something from the original trilogy. And I think Boba's story arc isn't one that takes up too much time within this season. I think they give us just enough of the character to lead up to the ending where we see that post credit scene and obviously spoilers if you're listening to this. I mean, everyone <laughs> who has listened to this podcast probably Oops. knows we go into spoilers at this point, but it really just felt like this nice mini story arc within the greater story that I think worked really well. Yeah, I I definitely agree. I, I mean, I Timothy Oliphant. Uh, I I I have to, you know, second just the the greatness that is Timothy Oliphant. Uh, it, he he is the that kind of actor. If he pops in in something, I'm just gonna be excited about it. If he's just showing up for an interview on Conan O'Brien. I'm going to be excited about it. Like I just, I love Timothy Oliphant. And it's funny you mentioned Fargo because I just finally started Fargo. It's been on my Same. list for a long time. <laughs> yeah. It's been on my list for a long time. And then my, my buddy's been telling me, he's like, you got to watch it. And I'd been catching up on so many shows because, you know, pandemic. Yeah. I had a lot of time. And so I finally like got to a point where I'm like, oh yeah, I could start it. And him mentioning after that episode, he was like, oh, yeah, by the way, Timothy Oliphant's in season four. I'm like, well, it's getting moved up to the <laughs> list. Like, <laughs> I got to get there. So I'm still in season one. So I got a bit to go. But ah, I'm excited for one, it. Season one so good. <laughs> oh, I, I'm loving it. Thankfully, I started season four recently because I had kept up with it. Or I might have started season one shortly after it had aired. But I'm 
a handful of episodes into season four now. I'll probably be done with it by the time everyone's hearing this. But yeah, <laughs> he's just such a fun character actor. It was really pleasant to see him in Mandalorian, even if it was just for one episode. Absolutely. And I, 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 I hope he comes back. I'm sure he will. The show does a really nice job of bringing in somebody on one episode and and then, you know, pulling them back in when the time is right. And to touch on Boba Fett, um, you know, I'd seen I've seen a number of takes where people are like, oh, did this season get, you know, too fan servicey bringing in, you know, Boba Fett? Is he going to outshine uh, Din? And I, I agree. I don't think he did. I think he served the story well and fit and blended in nicely without it feeling like, oh, man, Boba Fett's here. Cool. I don't care about Din anymore. I'm I'm gonna care about Boba Fett because he's the one I wanted to see this whole time. It's like I didn't have those those feelings. I'm still so invested in Din, and they didn't they didn't shaft him uh, like to the side. And uh, so I felt Boba Fett was really strong, and I'm glad that they kind of redeemed Boba Fett and made him the live action badass that we all kind of know he is, and a lot of people who have read the the expanded universe know how badass he is because let's be honest uh he, he kind of has a a lame death in uh return of the jedi and it was it was in in live action it was always the yes we, everyone likes boba fett but he also kind of just accidentally got killed and he has cool armor um it was you know and then they tried to redo it with captain phasma and she was also kind of whatever. So, uh, I was happy to see that, you know, in that scene, he's up on the mountain and he's, you know, taking out, taking out the stormtroopers. It was just so awesome. So I was stoked to have him. I was glad he didn't take over the show and I'm sure we'll get to, you know, talking about, um, you know, that post credit scene at some point, but yeah, I agree with everyone. I really liked it for a lot of those reasons. I think Boba Fett was, you know, he's not this, if you don't know a lot about the expanded universe, which I don't, um, you know, I've kind of just seen the movies and most of the TV shows and read a couple of the Han Solo books. Um, I was like, well, I feel like this character is kind of a blank slate. And so in that he was a bounty hunter and then, you know, just kind of unceremoniously is disposed of. And then I'm hoping to see more about him and what drives him now after, you know, do do they state how long it's been since five uh, years, five years. Okay. So return of the Jedi, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's a long time for a character and I'm glad that they, go in strong with a personality and he obviously has his experience changed him and we get to learn little bits about him like they just unfold his character so well and i really appreciate it in particular that they bring in the history that they'd set up for boba fett in the second trilogy released um you know we get about that he's a clone and that affects choices that they have to make and i loved my favorite thing about it is that they bought back uh Temora Morrison in it to play him cuz he is such a great actor and he fulfills this role so well and i know he was also really excited to get to play uh, boba for the first time so and he did the voice for all the clones throughout right. the Clone Wars series and so yeah I was a little wary at first but then they just knocked it out of the park with how well they did uh, his representation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I think that um, he was used the perfect amount. I love that you know from the very beginning when they say oh there's I believe what they set it up was oh there's a Mandalorian on Tatooine and we're just like okay we know what that means <laughs> you know and. I feel bad. I had kind of spoiled a bit of it for myself because I had read that Timothy Oliphant was going to be in the season. And I agree with everyone else. I mean, he is a very captivating actor. He always plays amazing roles. I always think of um, one of the things I always think about is him in uh, what was a girl next door, the uh, crazy guy. Uh, and then also he was in the fourth Die Hard movie, which I thought was enjoyable. And uh, Santa Clarita Diet. Uh, I did not watch Justified. I know my mother really likes him in that show, but I've always enjoyed him. I've always thought he's a really good actor. And I, you know, when I found out it was him, I was like, okay, so he's not Boba Fett. He's obviously right. an imposter, but this will be fun. 
And then they show you that little bit at the end of the episode. And we all know who it was. And then nothing for a bunch of episodes. And I was like, okay, so are we going to get more? Or is this going to be the whole season? And I kind of like that they did that. Because when they do bring him back, eventually, um, it's in such a good episode. And it, like, it that episode, you know, is just like, from the start to finish, just so much action going on. And I think for me, it's funny, I, I don't think I got the chills until like, even though we got him show up at the end of that first episode of the season, I don't think I really got the chills and it was real for me until the slave one pulled in to that planet. And I, I loved it. Everything about, I knew exactly where they were going and I was, it was just such a nice surprise. Cause like I said, we didn't know when he was going to come back. We just knew that he was alive and that they were teasing him. And, uh, you know, hey, surprise, surprise, now we get him for the rest of the season. It was just such a nice bonus. And I agree with everyone else. He wasn't overused. I think he was there to complement the story. But for those of us who are enough familiar with the prequels, you know, the inside jokes that they made about Boba Fett were so good. And the <laughs> callbacks, you know, whether I believe it was the episode where they brought back Bill Burr's character. And they were talking about how they wanted to come up to the gates. And he said, let's just say they might recognize my face. Yes, that was great. <laughs> yeah, that was great. It was a great line. And then there was a line, uh, you know, with spoiler, spoiler. Uh, I forget the other woman's name, who is the uh, other Mandalorian, um, Bo-Katan. And she said, I think she said something like, I've heard your name a thousand times or something. Like, or you're, I've heard your voice. You all sound the same or something. Like there were some really great callbacks around his character. And and I think everyone else said, you know, he, he wasn't given a lot to do in the movies. It really wasn't until we got Django Fett that you're like, oh, Boba Fett was really kind of like this guy. Now, obviously not just because it was the same actor, but you know, the same type of skill set that we never really saw in Empire Strikes Back or in Return of the Jedi. So I feel like he was kind of given his due and all of the nerds that like, had envisioned what he was either through the expanded universe novels or through the video games or any of that stuff. I think this was really for them. Um, but like everyone else said, I think he just did a really great job complimenting this season and it didn't become all about Boba Fett. It did not become the Boba Fett show. He was there to further the story. Exactly. And what they basically do with the season is they introduce us to these characters we're familiar with. And then Boba and Bo-Katan are both the two that kind of get more story by the end of the season. But they do all of the setup first and then return to them. So we have, you know, Boba appearing at the end of the first episode. Then you have the frog lady little arc there <laughs> and you get that. And then, in the process of that is where we see Bo-Katan for the first time. Then, of course, we have to catch up with Dune and Karga because they were in season one. So we have to have that sort of continuation of the story from season one. And then, of course, we will talk about this more in depth, but we have the Ahsoka episode. And then you finally get Boba Fett back for the rest of the season, basically. And I love within Boba Fett's arc too, that Fennec kind of ties herself to him. And it's like, they're this loyal tag team for each other. And I think both characters kind of need that given everything they've gone through. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to point out that, you know, she was really wasted in what I consider the weakest episode on season one. Uh, I forget what I think it was called uh, the gunslinger. This is the one where they're on Tatooine and it was like, it felt too fan servicey, even though they didn't actually have any of those characters in it. It was just like them sitting where Han shot Greedo. And it was yeah. just like, and I believe it was the first episode that Dave Filoni ever directed, which is funny because he also, I believe, directed the episode with Ahsoka Tano, which was just night and day difference in quality. But obviously I think that was, I think that was his first live action directing gig, or at least within the Star Wars universe, because I think he'd only done work on the animated shows at that point. 
Um, so, you know, I wasn't so surprised that his episode in his first season wasn't that great, but I felt like she was utterly, Fennec was underused. And I know a bunch of my friends felt the same way because they're a big fan of the actor who, who plays her. And I am as well. I, I've always been a fan of hers. And so to see her character redeemed and inserted in more of like a useful plot line was really nice. Yeah. So Filoni actually directed the very first episode of the show. Oh, okay. So he did not do the gunslinger. And then did he did do the gunslinger, but he okay. did the first episode and then the gunslinger was episode five and then he did the Jedi. So he's done three for the series okay. so far. And I I think he's a very good choice because, you know, well, first I want to ask you all, has everyone here watched Clone Wars and Rebels? If not, which have you watched? Um yeah, I I've, I've watched uh Clone Wars and uh and Rebels both. Okay. I think within the within the past the past year. I don't know if I did it by the time season 1 had happened, but I I I was filling in all my a, a lot of the the expanded uh like television stuff. I was filling trying to fill in all those gaps and until this show, like I just want to say until this show um you know, it's Clone Wars, especially, but also Rebels. That was like, oh, this is the best Star Wars, you know, since the since the original trilogy. Like that was everything. And to see in live action us get kind of the um, the equivalent of the excitement that those shows give me um, uh, is just it, it makes me very confident in how they're handling this show. And obviously the people involved uh with both of them certainly helps that. Right. Katie, I know you were in the process of watching Clone Wars. Have you finished that? And have you checked out Rebels at all? Okay. Not yet. My um, husband and I were like, okay, uh, we've watched all the Mando. We need something to keep us going in between episodes. So that's what we've been doing is binging Clone Wars. And I was shocked at how great it was because I I've I had seen the Gandhi Tartakovsky one okay. like that came out way 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 back when mm -hmm. and that was all my exposure to like the animated shows so it was great and I love that they've already pulled so much from that show into the Mandalorian but it is by no means required watching I think that was the perfect thing to do and that's what saves it for being too fan servicey for me right because I feel like for fan service you have to have seen what came before in order to get the joke if you or the story or whatever. And I don't think that's necessary with Mando like it is in, you know, say, Endgame or something on the Marvel Universe. Right. Jonathan, how about you? Have you watched the animated stuff? Uh, I've seen bits and pieces. OK. I follow enough uh, YouTube channels to understand who the characters are and what their significance is to the universe. I'm definitely not going to like claim that I understand everything because like I said I was more of like a cliff notes watcher I watched uh, in the background my roommate my old roommate Jason used to watch rebels and so I had some exposure to like Ezra Bridger and Sabine Wren you've seen and heard a few things from that then <laughs> I've seen and heard a few things from that and I knew who Ahsoka Tano was I know that the thing that I love about her character, or at least what I've heard of her character, is that the fan base originally was not very accepting of her from the Clone Wars movie. And then Dave Filoni really made, I mean, not just Dave Filoni, but, you know, those shows really expanded upon the character and made her beloved. And I knew that she was coming because obviously all of the rumors and the trades reported that uh, Rosario Dawson was going to be in this season. I don't think... I remember reading anything about Bo-Katan being in this season. I think that was an utter surprise for most people. If it was out there, I'm with you. I had no idea. So when Bo-Katan showed up, it was the holy crap. Yeah. And the fact that they even had the same actor who voices the character playing her, I think Katie Sackhoff. Yeah. What a nice thing for fans, you know? And once again, I don't feel like that's fan service. I feel like that's just doing right because she's a good actor and, uh, you know, really knows the character up and down. 
but I and I think I've seen bits once again bits of Clone Wars. I actually remember even before the Clone Wars movie, there was a cartoon on like Cartoon Network when I was a kid. I think it came out between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. That's the Gendy Tartakovsky one, the same guy who did um, Dexter's Lab and the Powerpuff Girls. Yeah, it felt like that. And yep. uh, I remember watching a few of those, and they were actually kind of fun. And now I definitely want to go back and watch some of the animated stuff. I don't know when I will find time, because <laughs> Deanna just reminded me of Fargo Season 4, which I still need to watch. <laughs> but I was familiar enough with these characters that – and I think – I think Katie said this, that you don't really need to watch those shows to get enjoyment out of these. Right. They were there. They served their purpose. It wasn't like they were making all of these callbacks to the shows. There was obviously the, you know, talk about Thrawn, which, you know, if you, once again, if you know a little bit about that stuff or even how Rebels ended, um, which I do know how it ended, you can kind of see where they're going with a lot of this stuff. But I don't feel like, any of it overshadowed, once again, the arc of this show. They were there solely to complement and expand and fill in the guts of all of these other things. And I think one of the things I'll, I'll leave off with is that I heard a lot of people say that Dave Filoni's work has really brought new life to the prequels or made some of the things from the prequels make sense. Um, and so I'm hoping we get a little bit of that from The Mandalorian for the new trilogy, you know, maybe make the new trilogy not have such a bad taste in our mouth based on what they do with this show and what they do with the other shows, you know, we're, because we're getting more. So we're getting a lot more Star Wars. So many more. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only thing that people who haven't watched Rebels in particular might be confused by is the mention of Thrawn because you have then no knowledge of why Ahsoka would be asking about this random person who you probably haven't heard of if you haven't watched Rebels because Thrawn was a big part of the Legends books. There's a Thrawn trilogy. There are new Thrawn so books. Good. He's one of the characters who they brought in from that sort of expanded universe that is no longer canon. And the fact that they introduced him in one of the animated shows, I think, makes it a little tough for people who have only watched the live action stuff. But when you see Bo-Katan and Ahsoka, you don't feel as confused about those characters. I would think I obviously can't speak to this as I have seen both shows and I knew who these characters were going into it. But by the time we see Bo-Katan, we know who the Mandalorians are, at least a little bit from season one. And then Everyone who watches Star Wars knows what a Jedi looks like. So I feel like <laughs> those two characters in particular, bringing them over from the animated shows and not needing that history is the perfect way to do that because we know that there aren't too many Jedi left at this point. That's kind yeah. of been made clear throughout the show. And I really think they did a nice job introducing these characters. And I think... One of the things about the animated shows is that they do just add so much more. Like if you watch Clone Wars, you will have a much deeper understanding of who Anakin is at his core. And I think that's something the prequels don't necessarily give us too much of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you have to say that Anakin is a completely different character <laughs> in Clone Wars. Like you and I have texted about yeah. this. He is such a completely different character in Clone Wars than he is in the movies. He's much more complex in Clone Wars. Yeah. Like I was like, if this is the character that we got in the movies, I would have been so much more invested in his story because it is a much more fascinating character that adds a whole lot more like you care you care yeah. what happens to him in the movies Absolutely. i'm like you're a jerk I'm, I'm not sad <laughs> and and why <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i'm brat. not sad we, to watch your legs you get it off you hate there. sand right <laughs> yeah you i and i hope you have sand and you know your pants for the rest of your life because you're so annoying <laughs> yeah well i was just gonna say i completely agree with yeah those those shows they add so much more so much more depth and complexity into the characters, into the stories, into the lore that, yeah, they, they, they honestly, they watching them 
And I, I didn't watch them as they came out. It, I definitely came to it later. And it was the reaction of, oh man, why did I sleep on this for so long? Because it, it made me appreciate so much mm-hmm. about that era of Star Wars um, because I now had all this kind of backstory, even if, you know, with a character doesn't perfectly mesh with the one in the in the movie it's still like in the back of my mind when i watch those now i have all this backstory and so having watched those it does certainly give this extra weight to the things you're viewing when when you see ahsoka tano you're that much more excited when they mention thrawn you're like oh my god that's awesome but i can speak to like my uh my brother binged all of season one and and season two so that he could watch the finale uh on time and he has only seen the original trilogy and the prequels he hasn't seen rogue one he hasn't seen i'm blowing him up on this but i have been on him about watching some of those uh but he is working on the the mcu right now and that is quite a task so not even the uh, sequel trilogy for your brother no he hasn't seen any any of that so i was i said to him when he was watching this i was like if you know if you have any questions just you know hit me up and i can kind of fill in some gaps and it was cool to see that as he watched the show it he was able to get this genuine enjoyment out of it and not have to ask a ton you know he sees ahsoka and she gives a bit of a backstory and he can see oh this is an awesome character with an interesting backstory and the mention of thrawn you know he in the moment you may not know oh who is she talking about but it but it's in her tone that tells you it's important and it gets you yeah like you want to know more like oh who's this new bad guy exactly you want to know more you want to know more now yeah. i feel like yeah that gives the show i think even more strength to know that someone who can come in with very base knowledge can can still get get hyped about all this stuff and the stuff he he doesn't know yeah he would start looking at it on the internet and then like text me and be like oh man i just read about this and be excited and that's yeah. the cool part about if something you know, Katie, you mentioned, you know, good fan service versus bad fan service. It's and, a very know, fine line. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And when it, when you don't feel like you're necessarily left out of the joke or left out of the cool nod, but it just makes you excited to, you want to learn about it, then that I think is where good fan service falls because right. it gives you the excitement rather than just being like, oh man, I'm bummed. I don't, I feel like I'm left out. Yeah, I think if anything, you hear that Thrawn mention after seeing such an amazing episode, and you're like, I feel like that for me, because I've heard so many good things about Thrawn, but I feel like for most folks, and maybe your brother after seeing that, he would want to be like, oh, well, now I kind of want to know what that is. You know, and I think that, like you said, that would be good enough where it's like, oh, okay, this is like, this is the back door. This is the back door on how you get people back into the other shows is to mention something that they now know is important and they want to be in on it. And so I feel like that was really well placed. And that was definitely one of those things that was for people that had watched the animated show. But like I said, also is enough of an intriguing uh, setup for people that haven't. Yeah, it feels like what they did is they when they validated all of that expanded universe stuff, they've now taken the stance of like, all right, well, let's just, you know, dip in and pull out what we want. And then we'll take from here and here and we can use that to craft this story. And it can be a new story for people who don't know anything about it. And if they want to learn more, they can. But Mm -hmm. for those who've been following along the whole time, they'll get this great big picture. And I thought that was... (laughs) They learn something from their making of Marvel movies, because that's definitely how Marvel has done the MCU, is they took all of this rich storylines and almost everything that's in those movies is something that comes from an earlier comic. So they've really hit the mark with that. Absolutely. And and I think you're right. They take what I feel like you could say exactly like they're using they're treating Marvel comics as Star Wars is treating the expanded universe, I guess, legends what they call it now, right? The non-canonical stuff. I would personally, like, I think, because, yeah, Thrawn was originally one of those things that they decided, oh, we really like this character. Let's make him canon and, like, see what we can do with him. And, you know, maybe someday we'll get the Mara Jades of the world. You know, that would be really nice. I know a lot of people would like (laughs) to see her added. I don't know if she's even 
been brought into any of the canon stuff these days. But, uh, you know, there's things like that that are really nice. And I do think that now that we're going to get this Ahsoka Tano show, you know, I think that might end up being for people who are really fans of Rebels and fans of uh, Clone Wars, especially since Rebels ended the way that it did there's still a lot to be told. And so, you know, there might be stuff that we, I feel like that's going to fill in a lot of those loose ends as well. You know, I assume the way they're going to handle the story, you know, you give this little nod of Thrawn and then there's going to be an Ahsoka Tana show. You assume, all right, you nodded to Thrawn, you're going to expand on that story. And right. the hope of what they do is that they they seeded it in live action and they'll explore it in live action to give like Katie said, people who haven't watched all these shows, their first experience with all these characters. And so if you don't go back and read all the comics, if you don't go back and watch all the cartoons, that's okay. You'll, you're still in, in theory from what the, it seems they're setting up, you're still going to get your own kind of full story with these, with these characters. And uh, that's my assumption and hope with, uh, you know, in nodding these that, those of us who have watched the cartoon, we're super hyped about this, these characters. You know, it's it's not like I'm, we're not gatekeeping being like, oh, I don't want people to have this character. We want everyone to know how awesome Ahsoka Tano is, whether you want to watch those shows or not. And she deserves the live action. So it's it's exciting to see it, it, all these these characters that have been kind of relegated to comics or books or cartoons. I'm excited for people who just... They, they only want to watch the live action stuff and that's fine. And I'm hoping they get to see the awesomeness of all those characters too. And I totally fit into that. I think I've told Deanna a few times that like, I want to like Rebels so much and I want to like Clone Wars and it's taking some getting used to the animation style, but the story is totally there. It's Star Wars, no question, through and through the voice and the tone and everything. And so like, Everything throughout this season has made me want to go back and give those shows a real serious try because I watched the first four episodes on my own of Rebels after having watched my friend or my old roommate at the time go through it and just kind of like while I was working, you know, I would watch it with him. So that was my only exposure. But like now, now I want to go back. I want to know more about that stuff so I can catch all the little nuanced jokes and callbacks, just like I did with all of the Boba Fett stuff. So there's, I feel like they did such a good job with that this season. There's so much to go back. And if you're a, if you're a new fan, you know, I'm just so jealous because <laughs> there's so much that you get to now go back and discover and digest. The thing they did really well with all of these character introductions this season too, is that every single one of them still serves the bigger storyline in an important way, because I think we're all in agreement here that the main storyline that has been the through point through season one and season two is protect the child at all costs. And yep. you see how Mando and the child are saved by the other Mandalorians. And that's our Bo-Katan introduction there. Even when Ahsoka comes into play, he is sent to her by Bo-Katan. And then she is able to give us the information that, hey, Baby Yoda's name is actually Grogu. You know, very important piece of the story there because now Mando has a deeper connection with the child because he finally knows his name, which is great. And I think even Boba just helping out and helping to protect the child in the episodes that he appears in, same with Fennec too, even though she had been introduced in season one, they all serve a purpose in the main storyline. And that is something that they do really, really well. And the Jedi lore that we get, even just from that one episode, is very, very cool because we get to see the seeing stone. We're seeing ruins of a temple and we're seeing a whole new planet from what I understand in Tython. Uh, yeah, I believe that was all new. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with it, if it is. At first, I thought it was a planet from one of the video games that I played. I thought it was mm. from Fallen Order, but I think that was a different different planet. Yeah, j just like you mentioning, you know, a ruined temple, like that was, 
you know, the excitement of Fallen Order was like, oh, like we're getting into some of that Jedi stuff, you know, in the live action. And I loved, you know, it's with with all these characters, uh, you, you made me think of it when you were when you were talking about how each of these characters kind of is serving the, the main, you know, the main storyline of, you know, protecting the child and, and everything. I love that anytime Mando shows up and, you know, one of the characters that, uh, you know, he hasn't seen in a while or, or something, um, you know, whether it was Bill Burr's character or they show up to see uh, Bo-Katan, you know, later. And uh, even when he shows up to, what's her name from the first season? Cara Dune. Cara Dune. Uh, when he shows up at first and, you know, he, he wants he wants to do something and she's like, oh, I don't mess with the Imperials or whatever. His follow up line is always just like the child's in danger. And like, like it's a flip of a switch. Everyone's like, what do you need? Here we are. Fuck it. I'm in. Like, yep, yeah, everyone like, says, oh, hell no. Son of a bitch. I'm in. Stand like, for this. Yeah. <laughs> the power of the child. Everybody yeah, loves like that baby. <laughs> yeah. Also, can we talk about that episode with where he shows back up with Cara Dune and uh, not was it Grief Karga? Is that Carl Weathers character? Yes. Yep. Where they brought back Horatio Sands' Mithril character, and he lets out <laughs> he lets out the dust from his neck when he sees him because he's so scared of him because he's like, oh, I thought you were somebody else, and then he shows up, and you can see how how frightened he is. Of yeah. Him. Even when they pick when they pick up uh, Bill Burr. And yeah. like Boba Fett, like first walks out and he's like, oh, phew, I thought yeah. you were some, I thought you were someone else. And then he shows up and, for, you know, shout out to Bill Burr. I really, really, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed him in season one cause you know, he was funny and he was, you know, he was being Bill Burr. He made a Jar Jar joke. Like I just, you know, I thought that that was fun this season. Like I really, really appreciated his performance. I, I thought he gave a, a great dramatic performance when they're sitting at the table like i was really really captivated with that whole episode obviously the awesome action you know that big chase scene but it like that that was i like how this show they introduced characters in season one and when they bring them back they're that much better and you're that much more excited everything about this season they took from season one and they strengthened what worked. Yeah. I thought Bill Burr's character was really great in that episode. Um, because I also felt like the episode that he was in in first season, while you, like you said, it had its really comedic moments. It was exactly what we expect of having Bill Burr as a guest star in a star Wars show. Um, this, they really gave him some depth, his character, some depth where he was going to. And that was one of the most tense scenes ever where they're sitting and having drinks with this officer and you could tell exactly what was going to happen. I mean, I called it a mile away. <laughs> I was like, oh, guy, he's going to shoot him. He's going to shoot him. And that... they're going to be screwed and they're going to have to be running away. But as soon as he walked in, you knew he was going to take his, his helmet off. You know, there was no other way around it. And uh, oh, man, yeah, that was that was a great episode. And I really, I agree. I think everyone they brought back that I felt was kind of underserved first season really got their due this season. Uh, and really hit their stride. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else felt this, but early in the season, like I, I really, really liked her character in, in season one. And then when she showed up and this has nothing to do with her, whatever personal things I, I was, I, I liked that character a lot. And so I was still looking forward to seeing, uh, that character come back. And it just felt like her acting performance was just, it was very bland and it, I don't know, something was off early in the season. And then the last two episodes, I thought she felt more like season one. And I was like, oh, okay, she, she's back, you know. But there was just something off and weird. I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, she. I agree, though. By the end, I think she had really done, you know, especially with them ta- tying her to Alderaan, you know, all of that. I yeah. don't think we found that out in the first season. I think that was all second season revelations. But yeah, I personally... While I'm not thrilled with how she conducts herself on the internet, uh, you know, I personally didn't, it didn't imp- impact how I watched her on the show, you know, and, and it didn't really matter to be a whole bunch. But uh, I do think that they redeemed her and many other characters by the back half of this season. I know, Deanna, you were getting into like the, the Jedi lore stuff and we, you know, kind of kind of went off on there. I don't know if you wanted to, if you had more you wanted to touch on. Yeah, I just think, obviously, with the introduction of Ahsoka, we're really starting to see 
more of the Jedi aspect of Star Wars in this season. So you have her with her dual blades and all of that is great, but it's really when we get to see Grogu getting in touch with the Force. And then obviously you have that moment where the Dark Troopers come down. And I think the Dark Troopers are a very fun addition to sort of the dark side of things, if you will, because if I'm not mistaken, they were introduced in like a computer game from the 90s or something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, Dark Forces. They yeah. Dark Forces video game. Right. And Oh, really? That's awesome. I think yeah. because we hadn't really seen any troopers like this, because in Clone Wars, you get lots of robots in Clone Wars, to say the <laughs> least. But Roger, roger. <laughs> They're more comedic, and these were just so intimidating, and they come back into play in the last episode, and I think what they did with both sides, with the Jedi, and then seeing Moff Gideon and the Dark Troopers, and even though we don't see any Sith, we also get the Darksaber, and I just kind of love what they did with a lot of the lore this season, because the Darksaber is something else that comes from the animated shows as well. Because that's this whole backstory in Rebels that you get. But you don't need that backstory to understand by the end of this season why the Darksaber is important to Bo-Katan. Right. They kind of tell you. And the funny thing is, I think that's another one of those things that like moves the story along. And you don't need to know the animated shows to understand what you're seeing. But at the same time, if you do watch the animated shows, it is that much sweeter for yeah. you. Um, I had never heard of the dark saber until the finale of last season and watching everyone talk about it. And then of course the conversation then shifted to, well, how did Moff Gideon get this dark saber? Does that mean Bo-Katan or Sabine Wren are somewhere involved? And it's really funny because one of the YouTubers that I respect and watch all the time, John Campia, he had mentioned people were like, well, doesn't that mean Bo-Katan's coming to the show now? And he was like, no, what? not so fast. I don't think Bo-Katan's going to be in the show. And that's why I was equally surprised when she showed up. That was such a nice thing. And I, from what I understand in the show, uh, you know, obviously we'll talk about what the implications of how it came into Mando's hand at the end of the season. But like, from what I understand on the show, she didn't battle anyone for that. Sabine basically found it on Darth Maul's planet and just basically handed it to uh, uh, Bo-Katan. So I think we might get some more of that backstory as well. But I do love that they were saying, you know, and we can jump to this, you know, I think this is probably a good segue to talk about Moff Gideon. But like, I I think that we're going to find out more of that. And I think it was really funny where she's like, well, I have to be the one to take him down. And none of us thought about that. Like, I didn't think, I I was like, oh, I thought she just wants her revenge. You know, like, she obviously wants something from him. I didn't know that it was going to be tied to... Tradition. Yeah, tradition. And so I thought that was such a great, that was such a, like, a very anxious point of contention. You know, it was like, oh, and you could see it in her face. And like, for me... You know, I was like, oh, well, what does this mean now? You know, where does this leave the two of them? Um, but yeah, I thought the way Moff Gideon handled that was like kind of showed his prowess for like uh, very crafty and sneaky like that. Psychological manipulation. Right. Is Moff Gideon something that was is referenced in the other in the animated shows? Or is this a character that's just come out from Mando? I think it's just Mando. OK, so our first intro to him is that first season. Yeah, because I... I really like his character and what he adds to it. And he plays it so, so, so well. And he's creepy and a little intimidating. And, you know, Giancarlo Esposito is a character actor that should get way more love than he does. Yes, I agree. And I th- I think he... And Katie and I don't just say that because we have a lot of fun watching Maximum Overdrive, okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a genuine love for Giancarlo Esposito. He's great. <laughs> and I think... You know, this role really gives him an opportunity to flex some flex his acting muscles in ways that he doesn't often get because he gets to be that uh, creepy manipulator as well as being a badass. So it's so fun to watch him. And I think going back to the Thrawn thing, because 
I think that's an even stronger reason. If he, if this is an entirely new character, then the show is obviously not afraid to introduce new villains. So for those who have no knowledge about Thrawn, mm-hmm. it, it just becomes another, like, oh, okay, who's this new guy? And they've done such a great job with, in, with placing Moff Gideon as this villain, even though, you know, he's not in every episode, he's not the problem every episode, but he's the overarching villain in the back and have they revealed that is he a sith i don't think they've revealed that because i don't think he is okay so it's not just me who's confused about it or who's not sure if he is they haven't revealed it yet and one of the things that i saw touched upon in one of the other youtubers that i watched is they were theorizing that like if he were a sith or if he was force sensitive in any way why wouldn't he just use his own blood instead of grogu's blood um but I don't believe that he is a Sith. I just think he's just an evil motherfucker. <laughs> right. So. Because you don't need to be a Sith to wield the Darksaber. That's entirely a Mandalorian thing and okay. completely separate from like having a lightsaber and that sort of thing. But I think in regards to Star Wars villains in general, because of how crafty like you guys said moff gideon is i think he's just a step below thrawn as far as level of intelligence and strategic thinking that he does because i don't want to give anything away for anyone who watched this season and heard the name thrawn and doesn't know who thrawn is so i'll just talk in broad strokes here but he is a very thoughtful character in the sense that he doesn't just go into things not having a plan or three. And so... Yeah, he's a master strategist. Right. Yeah, the master strategist is what I've always heard him referred to as. Exactly. And I think Moff Gideon is just a step below that, but that's perfect for where this show is right now. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's a... Especially because how the last episode ends is that Moff Gideon is you know maybe been taken down probably we'll see well, but yeah it, they've cha- triumphed over him at least once so now they have to, move on to the next level of challenge yeah i like that they didn't uh that they didn't kill him off and you know like not for lack of him Kate, trying <laughs> well yeah right. yeah like and you know katie you mentioned just how you know how good he is at just you know twisting things and just be it just those those little lines that he can, that he can get. Like, I think the great thing about Moff Gideon is that he, he's not underused. He's used at just the right amount. You know, they don't, they don't use him too much. So when he does show up, you know, he's just got these little moments and you're just like, Oh, you're, he's so evil. And then with the last episode of the season, they really took it to that next level where he did get to really, really stretch the acting chops, you know, in the, the conversation uh with mando when he's just uh when he's just standing there and he just got the dark sab- saber like right on uh i was about to say baby yoda but grogu um and you know he's just this kind of flippant you know i got his blood already i see the, you know i see the the uh the bond that you two have you know take him like it, it it and he's just playing him he's playing into his hand and then when they were on the bridge he was doing the same thing. You know, he's just, he's, uh, you know, talking to Mando and just staring at him saying, you know, you guys, you'll, you've, you've got some good firepower. You'll make a valiant effort, but in the end you'll all be dead except for me and the child. And he's just getting in everybody's head or, or trying to, you know, before, um, before the one X-Wing shows up, but he's, he's such a good villain. And I, uh, yeah, one X-Wing. Great. We're saved. Yep. Um, oh, but then you, but you know, but you yeah, know, sure. yeah. Everybody, that X-wing. Knew. Yeah. everybody knew exactly right. When this lone X-Wing shows up, you're just like, well, who could it be? Well, um, I, I want to, I want to, I want to touch on that because it's like the X-Wing shows up and I went through a mix of emotions, just playing with my own head. Cause it's, I see the X-Wing and I'm like, well, of course. I was like, I'm like, no way. I was like, it's got to be, it's got to be Luke. And then the uh, the door opens and the lightsaber comes on, but it's in black and white. And I'm still thinking, I'm like, no way. Like, is it Luke? Is it Luke? I'm like, but are they just messing with me? Like, are they? Is the show because the show 
is that good that I feel like, is it playing with my expectations? And they've done it and before then, with Boba Fett. Yeah. Right. And so then it's like, as it progressively happened, and then you see the green lightsaber and it's like, oh, it, it is Luke. And then and you, the, see, uh, the leather, you see the leather, leather the glove. one glove and they're <laughs> like, it is Luke and the belt buckle and just like all like it's just, it's just all these things that just kept building and building my excitement of of going from no way it can't they can't possibly be using Luke to it is it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> I was telling Jonathan that I keep spoiling these things for myself because yeah. there was a pilot early on in the finale and his voice sounded so familiar and it's because he was in the last season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So I went to go look up his name and then I was like, oh, well, that's going to happen at some point because, of course, Mark Hamill's name was above his on IMTV. Uh, and I was like, oh, no. I really need to stop doing that. Because I did the same thing with the season opener. I went to look up someone and then I was like, oh, hey, Boba's in this. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that happens to me sometimes too. I'm like, God, IMTV, yeah. why do I yeah. lose you so much? I can't even <laughs> get mad way. about spoilers because I do it to myself, you know? And I think with Moff Gideon in particular, he's sort of the perfect kind of villain for this show and then the added element of the dark troopers but i want to talk about something very specific with the luke reveal because as soon as he took the hood off you know obviously he's going to have to be aged down with cgi but as soon as he opened his mouth it just like didn't feel like a mark hamill performance right and that's that's honestly every response has pretty much said that like de-aging, it looks great. Like they've gotten it to the point where it looks so fantastic. But eh, when those mouths start to move, <laughs> yeah. when the mouth starts to move, that that's when people like lose it. But even you know? the sound of his voice did not sound like the typical Mark Hamill experience that you get when he's, you know, playing Luke in the past or even when he's in something like The Flash or he's voicing the Joker. It just felt a little off, but I will never be upset about an R2 appearance. And I loved just that little interaction between R2 and Grogu because there was like obviously R2 doing all his beeps and bloops and you know, you just see sort of the bewilderment almost on Grogu's face the entire time this whole thing is unfolding. Yeah. I had heard that their interaction to some people made it seem like they had maybe interacted before, like almost like R2 is excited to see him. So that was really interesting. Which wouldn't be a shock. Well, R R2 R2 was beaten up by by Yoda in Empire Strikes Back, so Yeah, I sure. wonder <laughs> if it was just a uh, familiarity with hey, Yoda is the only character I've seen who looks like this you. child, right? Yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of, you know, well, a, a couple things. One, it was, yeah, you, you take the hood off and it's the de-aging. And I will say there are times the de-aging has been used super well. And I, I, w I would say the Michael Douglas and Ant-Man. Yes. You know, also directed by Peyton Reed. I, I was or blown the Kurt away Russell by in, in Guardians. Yeah. Like I, I was blown away by those. This, it felt pretty good but it also felt like all right it's good but i'm seeing the budget of the show which yeah. is yes. greater than most tv shows probably but it's still a tv show and his the performance of the voice it reminded me of uh it reminded me of like in return of the jedi when he's saying like you will turn masters uh, when he's talking to jabba like through the the little recording thing he's like you will turn Captain Solo over to me and all that. Like it, it felt like the that performance, which you know maybe isn't best suited for this this moment. But it, it there there were little things certainly, and it was weird when he was moving his mouth, and you know it very the clearly dialogue felt, was not it, matching up. If it, it felt video gamey, you know, and yes. but it it was a moment of I was like, yes, I'm recognizing these things, but I'm also just super jazzed about this moment. Uh, it's clear that. This is this is just a really cool fan service moment by using Mark Hamill. If they were going to continue to use Luke Skywalker, I would absolutely want them to recast. Um, Someone mentioned to Sebastian me Sebastian Stan. Stan. Sebastian yep. Stan, yeah, and so it's like I I would totally I would totally want that if they were going to use Luke a lot more. 
But for a little five minutes scene, I'm like, you know what? Cool. Like, could it have been done better? Yes. Can we also talk about how did like none of these people recognize Luke Skywalker? Like, isn't Luke Skywalker? I mean, it's five years after Return of the Jedi. He's got to be, you know, some sort of legend at this point. Yeah, that was kind of covered in, I think, season season one, where you get to you get to like the outer rim of of, oh, of stuff and and the people they've got don't other know stuff going on are. they don't yeah, keep yeah, up yeah. with Absolutely. politics <laughs> right you know it's it, i they they recognize a jedi and i think the cool thing of like uh they recognize what a jedi is but you know when they're like are you crazy don't open the door it's like all to all of us it's like well it's a jedi he just saved you he's a good guy but to them it's like wait is he just gonna like murder all of us like what yeah <laughs> like yeah, we, don't, we don't know what to believe i think the luke thing for me was it was a real mixed bag i didn't mind him showing up but i agree that i i did not oof, like like you said you uh you really felt the budget <laughs> like it was yeah. Yeah. the eyes were, and, were rough specifically. and it felt like <laughs> they also modulated his voice and i think yeah. that's why the performance comes off so bad they uh, yeah. they you know probably change the pitch or something so that it it doesn't even really sound like mark hamill yeah it must have been him actually doing the voice but you're right they probably changed the pitch so he didn't sound as like grizzled an old man like he Right, it doesn't so sound like he's been like voiceover in the Joker for how many years? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think true. he he's a great voice actor and can yeah. really right. perform. And I would have been just fine if they hadn't changed his voice up. And like even the de aging, like I, I I don't know that did they use Mark Hamill as the they did okay. See, there was another there's another kid that I saw in a I'll get you the info later, but like yeah, they used a different person, an actor. Yeah, and that I think really didn't work. When de aging works best is when they have the actual actor there, right, and because right. then they can really map onto their face. Like that's why Kurt Russell in Guardians of the Galaxy two and Michael Douglas in Ant Man. That's why both of those look so good is because they're the original actors there, and they right. can just kind of okay, well, etch out some of these lines. And I think Michael Douglas specifically, it wasn't as drastic of a de aging. No. And they've both been acting forever. Right. So it, they yeah. have so much reference material to go back to. They just weren't making Michael Douglas look like a early 20s Michael Douglas. Right. Yeah. And I don't think they needed to go quite. I think they could have let Luke look because he's obviously aged hard with how they show him in yeah. the new trilogy. So mm -hmm. I felt like they could have let Mark Hamill do it and just gone a little more with it. Yeah. I feel bad saying this because, I mean, I'm certainly not putting him down, but I'm going to assume that Mark Hamill's not in the same physical shape <laughs> as he was in his 20s. And I think that's probably oh, no. why they use the body stand in. But like, like yes. you said, when they do that, you know, the difference is felt as opposed to like, I, I think it's funny that you mentioned Michael Douglas and Ant-Man. I think he was one of the best de-aging I've Agreed. ever seen. Yeah, he does look like young Michael Douglas. I don't know how many movies I've seen with him at that age. And I was like, oh, yeah. that's pretty right. good. Yeah. I was like, I'm ready for American President 2, like with de-aged Michael Douglas. Mm -mm. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, for instance, Samuel L. Jackson didn't look quite as good in Captain Marvel. Right. So right. it's kind of hit or miss with this technology still, I think. And especially once the character's start talking Talk. obviously yeah. samuel L. jackson was there for the captain marvel movie so they got yeah. the voice and everything you know the mouth down a little better there but i really do think that overall this season does a really nice job of just bringing in all of these other elements of star wars into the show and it's a lot but it's not too much and i think you know there's just a few other things i want to touch on here because i know at least some of us are really big horror fans here, and that spider cave was just so good because it had this kind of horror element to it to where you didn't really know what to expect. And just visually, the whole thing worked really well. And, you know, let's give another shout out to Frog Lady, you know. Heck yeah. <laughs> she was great. Also for not exploding on the child for eating all of the eggs. Oh I know. God, yeah. I was like, oh, she's good. Yeah, she had some patience. Yeah. 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 That episode, it, it uh, and I want to clarify this, my saying this, that episode could be like the only one in this season where 
where I'm like, it's filler-y, but yeah. I don't want to say that in a bad way because it just, it in the same way with like the animated shows, sometimes they would just have these episodes that you're just giving me new characters, new species, new worlds, and you're expanding the Star Wars lore and giving me something exciting to watch. Right. So it's like, was it a bit of a detour from the main story? Sure. But it it was done in such a, a fun way. And I really enjoyed Frog Lady. I really enjoyed that story. Uh, I laugh with the, the spiders thing because it's like, one hand, it's awesome. The other hand, what is with sci-fi and and fantasy and and giant spiders. It freaks me out every time. Yes, <laughs> you got Lord of the Rings, and it's it's just th- this and I blame Lord of then, the Rings for it. Actually, that was like kind of yeah. the first one. With yeah, Shalab. yeah. So <laughs> when I saw spiders, I was like, oh, of course. But at the same time, I was like, all right, this is also kind of terrifying and horror and badass, and I like it too. But I'm gonna be- begrudgingly be annoyed at space spiders. It was super just like a super cool episode and you know when the x-wing pilots show up and and save him and that was that was this little nod to where the rebel alliance is at this point like they're rebuilding the the new republic and uh like it it was just these little things to to expand the lore that yeah it kind of lets you know where you stand in the universe yeah 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 yeah, absolutely. Because you can see that they're like really in the beginning stages. And like one of the things, I mean, shout out to uh, New Rock Stars. If no one's ever seen New Rock Stars YouTube, uh, Eric Voss does an amazing job breaking down every single episode. Like every, he agonizes over all the details, including breaking down all the Arbish translations. And there's, uh, I believe, the episode where they bring back Bill Burr they're going through like the registry of all of these criminals or whatever people that are serving time. And if you look like some of them are serving 50 years for falsifying credits. Oh my God. Yeah. Like (laughs) it's, it's really funny. I'll send you guys the link at some point, but like he does such a great job and like breaking down that like, Oh, you know, yeah, they won, but like, they're not that great at like the new Republic or, you know, the rebels or whatever they're called at this point. I mean, it's like one of the reasons that like, you know, they think they're doing a good job, but like, you know, New Order gets the upper hand on them by the uh, time we reach episode seven, you know, like they were obviously operating in the shadows. And it's like, some of that has to do with how sloppy their work was. And I think this show, the, the specifically this season did a, a really nice job of continuing the the debate and the conversation that is kind of brought up a little bit in The Last Jedi, but explored a lot more, you know, in depth here, like we talk about with like the cartoons and stuff, this show is able to take the time to do it. And these conversations of, yeah, all right, you were, you were on this side when this event happened, but all these people were affected, you know, in this, in, in this certain way. And the, the question of, obviously we know who the good guys and the bad guys are, but even in the, not that I'm siding with the Imperials or anything, but in the, in the last episode, when the one guy mentions it was a small price to pay for to stop terrorism, it's like all the all these sides they have their own viewpoint of yeah. what they think is the right thing, and then everyone, uh, all the the little people on either side are affected by just these broad strokes of decisions that think that they're they're making the right call. And it, it the, I thought this season did a nice job bringing up those conversations. Obviously, you know, we're going to side with the Jedi and all that, you know, but, um, but it's still, it's interesting to think about when, and that's what I, that's what I've always been really hoping for with some of the, the new movies and the new shows is just give me, give me other sides of the galaxy, you know, especially outside of the, the Skywalkers and, you know, those core characters. It's like, I want to see how the rest of the galaxy is, is affected by all this stuff. I want to see their perspective. So I'm excited that this show is, and I just want it because I just popped in my head and I don't want to forget it. But Jonathan, you mentioned earlier the, I think it was you that mentioned that this show could perhaps do some things to maybe fill in some, some gaps or kind of course correct some things that maybe we'll feel stronger about, some stuff we didn't like in the new trilogy and and things like that. And um, I saw someone mention, 
and it's probably a, a good point and probably correct that when Grogu is on the seeing stone and he connects with the force, someone mentioned there's the moment in Rise of Skywalker with young Luke and young Leia where they're, you know, training and parrying and both of them kind of stop and they have this weird pause that I never noticed until I saw someone on the internet pointed out that they have this weird pause of almost like, did he connect with something in the force? And mm. with the fact that Luke then comes to save the day, someone wonders, did Grogu connect with Luke in that moment oh, from rise I, of Skywalker? That and that I thought about I, it, I didn't either, but it's like, I, it's interesting to think maybe these tiny yeah. little things will fill in some gaps and absolutely just further explore the universe. The way I'd seen it was like the way, the way it had pre- pre- been presented to me and a lot of the, the reaction I've seen to the animated shows online has been that they've given me a new love for the prequels or they've not, they've made me appreciate some of the stuff that happened in the prequels because I have this knowledge or I have this backstory now. And so, yeah, I feel like, they're definitely going to try and do the same thing with not just this show, but all of the other shows, you know, they have other shows coming. (laughs) So (laughs) many shows. Yeah. Katie, are there any final thoughts you have on anything else that happened in the season? You know, I was just surprised at how well put together it was. You know, the first season is great, and it was a really good jumping off point for the show, but there were definitely for me a few episodes that did feel like, I don't know if I either, A, I don't know if I really like this or if it really fits in with the story. And then this one was much more cohesive and felt like it had a a driving storyline behind it, which I think a show like this really needs because this is very much a Western. Oh, and I also have to give a shout out to... um, Ludwig Göransson, I believe, is the con- is the composer for this because holy buckets does he do such a great job of the making... score went to a whole other level. On yeah, the- <laughs> and this is yeah. it's obviously very influenced by um, you know Sergio Leone's uh, mm-hmm. oh god the Clint Eastwood series, the Few Dollars trilogy. Yes, that's what it's called, and uh, you know the amazing composer work on that, and that really sets the tone. And it feels like the rest of the show does its level best to live up to that tone. And I think in this season, it really nailed it. So I was, and I cannot wait for season three, even though I will say I wasn't necessarily happy that, you know, didn't let Grogu leave his sight. I think that was yeah. the only <laughs> thing I really didn't like. That battle was good, though. The battle was great, but that Din Djarin isn't in the child's life anymore. I'm like, that's not cool. They have a bond. <laughs> that baby has been abandoned so many times. <laughs> I think next time we see him, he's going to be teenage yoga Yoda. Yeah, yeah. and that's like, that's what I'm like. Teen, like teenage Groot. <laughs> exactly. Just My like guess is scene. that next season there will be something that calls the man calls Mando to go and isn't save he technically already again. fifty though? Yeah, yeah, he is, yeah. but he's still a baby enough that he can't talk because right. we know he's, that Yoda yeah. can talk, right? So. Yeah. Teenage and Yoda years is is different. Yeah, maybe that's like what 150. Maybe this is like elves maybe, in yeah. Lord of the Rings, where they're still babies yeah. until they're like 400 or something. I do think we will see him again at some, but it'll probably be like one of those like episodes where he like shows up and he's like, "Hey, I need this information." Oh, good to see you, kid. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, good that you're, you know. But I, I personally was actually kind of happy with that because. It doesn't, it's now not the Baby Yoda show. So you think anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we'll get him back at the end. Next of the season, season, he's just going to be depressed and eating space ice cream, miss, yeah. missing the kid and just <laughs> right. with like with some with some helmet, alien version know? of all by myself playing in the <laughs> background. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it, I do think we will see him again. Before we move on to some other season three predictions as we wrap up here, we do have to talk about the post credit scene which is where we return to Jabba's place and rest in peace, Bib Fortuna, even though nobody likes you. (laughs) Bib Fortuna. I feel like anyone who sits on Jabba's throne has to like super fat getting Jabba sized, basically (laughs) quadruple chins. He had definitely oh. been living the life. Like if you look at what he used to, like everyone yeah. that I saw reacting, we're like, oh, he's clearly like fallen into the role. Yeah. 
I wonder if some people were like, oh my goodness, this is us during quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and they even brought back the actress from Return of the Jedi who was like on the barge. Was that, it her? Uh, though, yeah. Apparently it's the same actress that uh, with the red hair, like the red spiky hair. She's back as like, you know, That's one cool. of those people. And I felt like it was really great how that whole scene almost echoed Return of the Jedi where like, you know, he, they shoot one of the guards and then it falls down the stairs and it's just like, oh, okay, I see where we're going with this. You see the shadow of Boba coming down instead of the shadow of Luke. And yeah, um, it, they, they, I mean, the show is very good about finding those parallels. I mean, even we, I, I guess I surprised we didn't even bring it up when Luke is going down the hallway, taking out all the dark troopers. Yeah. It's like super mirroring the hallway scene in rogue one with Vader. Yep. You know, yeah. like father, like son. Um, yeah. But the, yeah, I mean, the post credits was, it was just, it was so cool. It wasn't too much. And I mean, I definitely, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting, I thought the, as the post credit scene is happening, I'm like, oh, this is, this is badass. And it always oh, sitting on the throne. Yeah. And it, it's, it's so clearly like a comic book cover. Like it, it, yeah. or, it just looks awesome. Um, and, but then when, it flips and it says, um, you know, book of, Boba uh, book of Boba. I was like, Oh, I was like, I wasn't expecting that. Like, I just thought, Oh, it's a tease that he's still out there. That's yeah. all I thought it was going to be. So I was stoked when the, uh, um, I definitely lost my mind when the, when that text came up. Because that has been rumored for a long time. In fact, the rumor was that it was originally going to be, I think a Josh Trank was going to be doing the show. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who aren't familiar, uh, Josh did, uh, well, he did Fantastic Four, which we can try and forget, but um, <laughs> also he's done some other stuff that was pretty good. So he was originally attached. And then, of course, a lot of people, including Pedro Pascal, thought that he was playing Boba Fett in The Mandalorian uh, originally. And then John Favreau and Dave Filoni had to explain, like, no, you're actually playing a different Mandalorian. <laughs> now, I will say this. I am excited, but I also hope it's a mini series. I don't need an entire show of Boba Fett. I feel like it would be so much better if it's like a six episode thing, like what they're doing with Obi Wan Kenobi. But I trust them at this point, since they've done the character so well in this show, that I'm excited to see what they do with it. No question. And he was just so fun, this show. Like the humor that they gave him. In the episode where he puts his armor back on, that which, by the way, we should mention, that episode was uh, directed by Robert Rodriguez. Yes. Yes. <laughs> which it shows. It had yes, best, so much slow mo. Literally all the good stuff from a Robert Rodriguez movie, um, and even some of like I wouldn't say campiness, but like the humor, like where Boba Fett shoots down the ship and he goes, "I was aiming for the other one." Oh, I yeah. thought that was one of the greatest things ever. And so I'm excited to see a show about that. I'm excited to see because he's just he's he's so different and similar to Mando, you know, but he's got his own personality and he's he's weathered and he's seen some shit. Um, and I think that will be that will be interesting. That was a surprise to everyone. They didn't announce that as part of the big slate at the investor meeting. They probably didn't on purpose because they knew the scene yeah. was already filmed. Yeah. yeah. And I think I thought that was awesome because it's like, you know, there is this huge slate and, you know, uh, the big studios like that's I mean, that's now the the thing. It's oh, here's the next 10 to 20 years of all the content. And sometimes it's hype and sometimes it's well, it would be kind of nice to be surprised by some of these things coming. And so yeah. when you give when you give us a reveal like that, it it just feels that much more exciting because it, it wasn't just at a press conference where we're expecting a reveal. It was, it was unexpected. It slapped us in the face and we, and we were stoked about it. I'm yeah. right there with you. I, I hope it's, I, I guess that one of the big debates I've been seeing and I haven't, I've been very busy, so I haven't really been online is, so I don't know if it's been clarified or not, but a lot of people are like, Oh, is the book of Boba season three or is there yeah. actually going to be a season three? I, I'm on the side of, I hope it's a, a limited series before season three, mostly because uh, one, there's still so much story left with Din, um, yeah. and, uh, the, um, 
I won't jump into that because I know Deanna is going to get us to season three discussions first. Yeah. But um, but also, if it's not part of season three, that just means we get more show and I don't get only just a limited amount of episodes with Boba and then still have to wait for for Din. So I hope it's separate for that reason, because I want more of Boba, but I also yeah. want more of Din. I would be very surprised if season three is now Boba Fett show. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I think it is going to be a limited miniseries um, with all the scum and villainry uh, <laughs> of places like Mos Eisley and like, you know, Jabba's palace. I think we're going to get the way he sat down all mob boss style. And then like Fennec's yeah. there drinking the Spotska. <laughs> like, yeah. It just felt so on character for Boba Fett. So I, I do believe and at least hope that it's just a mini series of his own. I'd be really surprised if they're like, oh, nope, now it's not. I, and also, we need to talk really quick before we dump into season three. But I guess the segues is like he took his mask off at the end again in front of a bunch of people. And I think that will play into season three at some point. Like, I do think I do think we're going to see a lot more Pedro Pascal's face moving forward. Right. Katie, do you have any quick thoughts on Boba? I'm very excited to see what they do with it. It looks like a interesting show that I hope they do stick to, like you guys said, having it be a smaller show with a lot going on in it. So I'm excited for it. I think I'm surprised, honestly, at how excited I am for all of this <laughs> new content. Like, And I think that's all entirely due to Mando. And I think Boba's addition in it really proved how strong this show is at crafting a new style of story in the Star Wars universe uh, that doesn't rely on the Skywalkers or the more traditional tropes or anything like that. They've really decided to let it expand out. And even with this character, especially, you know, allowing us to see this different and unique side of Boba Fett and allowing him to become something other than just, you know, badass bounty hunter is a wise decision in my opinion. So I've just really loved it. And I'm hoping for, I'm hoping to be, just as happy with, you know, Boba Fett's show as I am with Mandalorian. Yeah, I'm all in on whatever they feel like giving us at this point. I have <laughs> no qualms about how much content there is. And, you know, everyone here knows that I recently started a YouTube channel. And one of the things I did recently was I talked about how maybe Ahsoka Tano should die in The Mandalorian. Obviously, I did that before they announced her show. But I think what's going to happen is... Season three is going to run parallel to some of these other shows because we heard Ahsoka mention Thrawn in The Mandalorian. So it's unclear whether or not Thrawn will show up in The Mandalorian season three or in the Ahsoka series, because I don't think everything they announce by any means is going to be an ongoing series. I think some of them will be limited. Some of them might go two, three seasons, maybe we'll see. But because Disney announced so many things, it's hard to predict because we don't know what is going to tie into what. As many superhero TV show watchers know, the CW does something similar with the DC shows. They run separately, but then they do these big crossover events. So we could see something like that potentially happen with season right. three of Mando, Ahsoka and Boba Fett. And it all comes together in the end. Yeah, and and Kenobi. Is Kenobi going to get in? Because he was on the set. Ewan McGregor mentioned being on the set for one reason or another that wasn't related to the Mando show. It was something for the Kenobi show. But if he's on there in the same time. We know that Kenobi takes place 10 years after Revenge of the Sith. And, the you know, and also apparently Hayden Christensen's in it, which is yep, which, that's interesting. Yep, choice. Um, I'm super curious to see what that means. I'm all for it. I mean, c come on, give him a chance to, uh, redeem himself. You know, a lot of these other people get to redeem themselves. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's be fair and say that maybe it wasn't Hayden Christensen's fault because that script and the lines he's given are hot garbage right. for the most part. So right. maybe if he's given a good script with good direction, he can do something more. And I'm willing to give, you know, that guy Absolutely. that chance <laughs> oh he's a and by the way i've you know even before episode two came out one of my favorite movies growing up and i know some people might disagree or you know have not seen it but life as a house is a fantastic fantastic movie with uh kevin kevin klein and uh hayden christensen for anyone 
who's curious about I've his not type seen that, of but I do love Kevin Klein. So yeah, I would yeah, highly recommend Life as a House. That movie makes me cry like a baby every time I see it. It's really sad. <laughs> I appreciate the heads up. I'll have the tissues ready. Yeah, yeah it's I, good it's to know. a really good movie. It's um, I used to sh- I used to tell people about that all the time, and uh, then yeah, I agreed. I felt like he was just kind of written really poorly in uh, those Star Wars movies, which was unfortunate. And I'm curious to see if that means it's going to be flashbacks or if it means like they're going to show him without the mask occasionally. Cause I mean, obviously, you know, he hasn't, he wasn't the guy playing him in rogue one and then uh, James Earl Jones is getting older. I don't think he's going to be doing the voice. So I'm curious what that means. Hayden Christensen being back in the show. And I don't think we're going to see, I think it'll be in the background. You know, I don't, I don't, I legitimately don't believe that they actually see each other again until new hope. Well, I think there is some mention that um, Ewan McGregor has mentioned that it did bring him and Hayden Christensen back together. Like they they were on set together at the very least. So okay. I wouldn't be surprised to see them come into contact. Yeah. But who knows? That'll be interesting. Someone has pointed out with the lines in New Hope and everything that they're just vague enough that... Um, they could have met they, up. Or they could have met up, and it'd mm-hmm. still be a really long time before uh, New Hope. But uh, but in terms of season three for Mandalorian, I want to say it's been confirmed that Mandalorian season three, Rangers of the Republic, and uh, Ahsoka are all going to um, run parallel. Run parallel and move towards a big event. Okay. Um. So probably a la Defenders kind of thing. Hopefully better than the Defenders. L- let's Definitely. say a la Crisis on Infinite Earths or something instead, because that's right. at least fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was going to say Taika Waititi has a movie too that we still haven't gotten information. That's true. About. We still don't know what that is. Oh, that'll um, be that'll be great. I'm excited <laughs> for that. I'm I'm excited for for more season three. Yeah. Or more Din in season three. And yeah, Katie, I know, I know, I was sad that. Baby Yoda was taken away as well. Uh, but I am also kind of happy to get away from that story for a little bit because I feel like get away from it before it becomes stale. Um, I think you can build on it. And he's, he promised they will see each other again. So we will see. Although he went off with Luke and we know what happens to Luke's uh, school. So right. I think there's so much more for his story to tell. That I mean, they keep seeding you know, taking back Mandalore that built this stuff up with Bo-Katan and uh, Mando still has the dark saber. She won't take it. Um, and so th- there's all that. There's so much to explore. And you mentioned, you know, just the, the greatness of this show that it does with the inspirations from the, the Westerns with the mix of samurai. And you especially see that in um, the Ahsoka episode. I mean, both samurai and like westerns are super super heavily influenced in that and uh it, it even in the fact i want to shout out to i can't forget his character i can't remember his character's name but he was like the main guy at the in the town that mando has the shootout with and the fact that he gets to have a western shootout with the actor who played johnny ringo in tombstone oh my god awesome. it is that guy yep so i i was super stoked about that i mean it so that's like I don't know if that's fan service, but it it felt like fan service to me because <laughs> I but love the best Tombstone. kind. Like yeah, it's such <laughs> so. a and such a nod to what they're doing, and I thought that yeah. was, I agree that one was so good. And the setup for when Ahsoka is fighting, who is that lady? Does anybody remember? I her forget name? her name. But she's I great. Like too, how yeah. that whole shot is set up and the fight and it all looks so very samurai and Western. I'm probably going to butcher her name, but she was the city's magistrate, Morgan Elsbeth. Excellent. Is that her actor? Is that her the actor's name? The character the name. Character? Okay, got it. Diana Lee Inosanto is her is the actress's name. Oh, okay. What do you think uh, season three is going to have, Katie? What do you, uh, what do you foresee happening? Okay, so my predictions for season three, I think that the Bo-Katan stuff is going to come into play and that that's where Mando is going to go next because he's going to have to solve the problem with the Darksaber and he all but promised Bo-Katan that he would help her take back Mandalore. So I think that's probably where we're going to go with this. But I also really hope that we do get to, even if the child isn't with Mando, that we still get to see some of Grogu's journey because otherwise it would feel 
I would be disappointed and it would feel like they You'll didn't. You'll feel cheated a little. <laughs> yeah. I feel like they didn't explore. They're really good at exploring all the options they have with that they set up with the story. So it feels like it would be a it would be a miss to not continue that on. Maybe in another limited series. Yeah. yeah. They don't have enough shows. Jonathan, do you have any other predictions for season three? I know you touched on a couple of yours. That was my pretty much my season three prediction. I think that it's going to center on them trying to take back Mandalore. I love how that guy's... I think someone said it's like practically turned it to glass. Um, yeah, Boba said that, I think. Yeah, like I think that there's a lot to explore there. I love that that look of contention and like frustration on on Bo-Katan's face when she sees that she knows that she can't take the dark saber. I wouldn't be surprised if some sort of like unwilling, you know, like not necessarily that they want this, but like, you know, it's going to build some sort of rivalry between them, you know, like, like basically that like Din Djarin just uh, opened up a can of worms and he has no idea what he just did. Um, And so I do think that that's going to come back and be a recurring theme. And I, like I said, I also think that based on how willy nilly he was about his helmet at the last episode, taking it off in front of all of these people, including, you know, a Jedi and all this stuff. I do think that very similar to Bo-Katan and to all of the other Mandalore, like Boba Fett, like I do think he's going to be more lax about taking his helmet off. And I do think he will continue to wear it, obviously, because it's a big piece of his armor and he needs it. But I do think we are going to see more of his face uh, in season three. I hope we do. He's just such a great actor and he's very uh, attractive to look at. So, you know, it'd be nice to see some more Pedro Pascal. Yes, it would. I just really hope they let him explore some of his Mandalorian roots a little more because we have very little backstory on him as a character. And I think if he returns to Mandalore, that will kind of give you this better feel for who those people are, because we haven't seen that in the live action. We've seen it in the animated shows, but there hasn't been too terribly much done on it. It did exist in some of the Legends novels and stuff. I believe I have a book on my shelf called The Mandalorian Armor, and we get that part of the Mandalorian lore in season one. We got the armor, the Beskar, all of that stuff. But I think there's so much more to the Mandalorians that has yet to be explored that I hope season three digs into that a little more in the same way that Rebels did in one or two of the story arcs there. Yeah, that was pretty much what I was what I was uh, about to bring up because it was kind of nodded to a little bit of his history. I think it was when he first met up with Bo-Katan and we kind of learn he was raised by Mandalorians, but kind of like super, like a super conservative, like cult of Mandalorians. Like a zealot, basically. Like they were like, you're the crazy one, dude. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, That was awesome to find out. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there, I agree. There is, there's so much of this backstory of like, who was he raised by and how are they different than these other Mandalorians? And that would be really interesting to, explore and flesh out more as he learns about kind of all the other Mandalorians and maybe learns, okay, like maybe there was some crazy stuff about how I was raised and I can be a little more relaxed and take my helmet off. And, but it's, it, it, there does seem to be this so much extra lore out there to explore. So um, I'm right there with all of you to the excitement to see, see where they take that. Yeah, well, thank you all for joining me. A quick note to the listeners, if you want even more talk on Mandalorian Season 2, my friends Jacob and Mike host a Star Wars podcast called Bantha Fodder. They are taking it a few episodes at a time, and they're going way deeper than we are. I think all of their episodes have been over two hours so far. So there's lots more content there. I'll have a link in the show notes for you guys to check out their podcast. They're always fun to listen to. And Tim, Jonathan, Katie, thank you all so much for joining me to discuss season two of The Mandalorian. I'm sure you will all be back soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me.
All right, everyone, that does it for this episode of Welcome to Geekdom. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so through our Patreon. You can sign up for a dollar a month. That'll get you a thank you on the show. Two dollars a month, you get to pick a topic that myself and a guest will discuss on the show. For five dollars a month, you can join the Welcome to Geekdom Slack group, where you can talk to myself and various guests who have been on the show. If you want to follow us on socials, you can do so at Geekdom Pod on Twitter and at Welcome to Geekdom on Instagram and Facebook. And as always, thank you for listening and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.